Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for everything that you've done, will do, and have finished on that cross. All you call for us to do is to believe it, to walk in it, and to do what we believe. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Again, every day, forgive us. Discipline us because you love us. Help us. Guide us, teach us. Prune us, cleanse us, wash us, renew us with new hope, new love, new mercy, new wisdom, new understanding. So we can extend everything that you give to us to a dying world. In Jesus' name I pray, speak through me. Amen. If you guys did not see the other sermon, it was really hard for me to do that one. I do not like chewing anyone out. I don't, I want to avoid it. I don't, last thing I want to do is discipline my kids. But I need to. And I believe that's the last thing that God wants to do. That's why Revelation is at the end of the book. But he has to to show his righteousness and his justice. Thank God I don't have that responsibility. I only have my own little family and um, whoever God wants me to minister to. Each and every one of you are important to him and you're important to me. If there's anything I want you to take away from any of these sermons or any of these messages or whatever, So I want you to take away that God loves you. He loves you. He gave his only son to show that love, to buy your sins, to take them away. And he wants to take that away from you and he wants to give you a whole new life, a whole new perspective, a whole new mind, a whole new heart, a whole new spirit. He wants you to be fruitful. In other words, he wants you to be happy. As a good father wants for his children, we want to see our children happy. We want to see them successful. We want to see them thriving and helping others. We want to see them change the world for the better. Now, as I prayed, this world is dying every day dying from sins some of you guys are probably asking what is sins I hear it a lot it's something bad that I do yes but not everything we do is bad and the Bible gives us a list of things to do and things not to do and when we sin against each other we're sinning against God and if we don't know what the Bible says that's written on our conscience of right and wrong, morality, of truth, of right from wrong, good and evil, light and darkness, then we're going to live our life feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, being angry, and all the bad things that God never, ever intended us to feel or go through. We're going to end up in bad relationships, and we're going to end up alone without friends or family. God corrects us because he loves us and he loves you. And even if you don't know him, does not mean that you can, you can sin without consequences. Your conscience bears witness of what's right and what's wrong. And when you do what's wrong, even though you don't know the law written in the Bible, it's still written in your heart and you're held accountable to that. So whatever you're feeling and whatever you're going through, your conscience is telling you what you're doing is wrong. And if you want to know the right way to live, open up God's 
Bible, the Holy Bible. There's only one. There's no other book that God's right that God wrote. So with that being said, let's peel open the pages and let's get deep or let's get refreshed or let's hear this message for the first time over again because we need to hear it every day. I need to hear it every day. I have Bible tracks. I have all kinds of books and and I read kids books on the Bible because I just need to be refreshed. I need the gospel message to be simplified to me every day because I look at it and I go... I read all these theology books and I read all these other books about the Bible and commentaries and all this stuff and I get deep, but sometimes we just need something simple again. One of my analogies in the past sermons have just been, you need new faith every day. You need to be baptized every day. What I mean is soaked in the spirit every day. You need new forgiveness and mercy from God every day. You need new knowledge and wisdom every day. God says, I make all things new. So that's what these sermons are for. It's to tell you over and over and over and over again, God loves you. God forgives you. God wants you. You're wanted. You're forgiven. And you are loved. That's every sermon. Every sermon you hear, you should ever hear is the same thing. God wants you. God loves you. God forgives you. Over and over and over again. That's what we preach every Sunday. We preach about Jesus. What God offered to us, what he offers us every day is a day of salvation, a message to call his people, to call you his own. Maybe you're feeling unwanted. And that's what the Lord, he says, I want you, but I don't want you just five for five minutes, like some people, 10 a day or two or a week, and then eventually I get tired of you. No, he says, I want you every day. You see, in this world, it tells us, I only want you if you look like this or you act like this or you do this for me. But God says, I want you regardless of those things. And part of our Christian walk is when we receive that knowing I am loved, I am wanted, I am accepted by a holy, loving only one true God who created me and wants a deep relationship with me, when we get into his word, when we get into prayer, we will start to realize our purpose here. You have a purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, then you have no hope. And if you have no hope, then everything in life is meaningless. You're just striving after chasing love that isn't on the cross. You're chasing this world's definition of love of acceptance and you'll never be accepted in the world's eyes today they'll accept you and tomorrow they'll reject you but jesus says i will always accept you and if you can experience that for yourself then you'll be truly happy with who you are and then you can truly love people for who they really are you can see past all of their sins all of the mistakes or all the things that people say about them And you can accept them as God accepts you. But you have to receive it by faith. And faith is another word for trust. You have to believe what the Bible says about him, about you, and about sin in this world and demons and all of it. Everything. It's already there. The problem is we need to believe it. And we need to start walking it out. So, all that being said, Let's get to it. Okay, today I have a powerful message, I believe. And I hope it's powerful. (laughs) Not that it's in myself to preach it, but I hope the Holy Spirit takes it away and recalls the things that I was talking to my wife about this morning. Um, So what we were talking about was basically how God uses average people that no one knows about, that no one cares about, that no one would even think about. He takes the things that the world thinks is foolish, right? In other words, unless you're popular, unless you're famous or something like that, right? You're not important, right? It's kind of like high school. I mean, right? It's just, oh, you don't have the new Jordans or, oh, you're not the smartest person or, oh, this or no that. The world boasts and makes idols out of all kinds of things, right? But Jesus says, I take the things that you would least expect and I get glory and honor by it to shame those 
who are powerful in this world, to shame those who have, who think they're powerful or think that they're the most amazing person in the world or most amazing people in the world. I shame them with the things that they hate, the things that they dislike, the things that they look down on. I take people like me, he says, I take people like you, I take people, and that's what the church is built on. It's built on a bunch of, in other words, losers. What the world calls is they're losers. They call us losers, they call us nobodies. And God says, I take the things that are weak in this world, that are losers in this world, that the world despises and looks down on. I take those things and I glorify them. And here's a prime example. You will never find a prophet. You will never find uh, an evangelist or, or an apostle or Moses or David. God never changes. He never changed. We changed. His word is timeless. It meant the same thing as it did then as it does now. I look at the Bible and I see what it means to me. It's happening all around us. People's behaviors are, are written in testament in the Bible. And I see it with how they behave, how they act, how they treat each other. I see the sins, what it tells me, what, I, what it says. It's right there, written in the Bible. Let me give you an analogy the, uh, of what it, one of the, I think it's in Proverbs, where it says, the buyer says, that's a bad deal, that's a bad deal, and then gets it for a cheaper price and then walks away boasting. In other words, you ever have someone go into the store and they say, that's a ripoff, and then the the owner or someone merchant or someone they lower the price and they say okay i'll sell it to you for that and they go and they walk away and they rejoice the bible says that's in there they did this back in the biblical times and people still do it today i was working at a grocery store and i saw a woman she was complaining she came to my line i was a cashier she complained 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 and then we're told for given situations that we can lower the price so we lower the price and she walks away happy and i think to myself wow prophecy right there revelation right there the bible is true she just did it even though she doesn't believe in it another example is the bible says in proverbs a fool says something and then he says i'm only joking how many times do you hear that in the world where people say that they say it. they say something cruel right and they only, and then at the end of it they say i'm joking the bible this is a 2000 year old book and it says that people were back in the day, in biblical times, they did the things that people today are doing before they were even born. That's amazing. God never changes. His word never changes. His judgments against who we are and our nature never changes. And I say all that to say this about the prophets. When Moses was called, when all the prophets were called at their times, no one cared. Moses had a really tough time with Israel after the exodus of Egypt, out of Egypt, to the point where they doubted him the whole time that he was called by God. They doubted him. They even hated him. They even tried to kill him. Moses, Moses of all people, he's God's chosen one, right? And Moses doubted it too. Moses was like, are you sure you called me? Because these people want to kill me. I'm not worthy. Right. So with that being said, David, David, King David, he was a shepherd boy. He was a scrawny little boy in the middle of the desert or forest or whatever. He was he was shepherding sheep and occasionally killing wild lions and bears. Scrawny little 14, 13 year old boy. And when Israel is about to enter into war with the Philistines, I believe there were the Philistines with Goliath, and Goliath was murdering everyone. Long story short, <clears throat> it was like the, the typical Troy, the movie Troy with Brad Pitt. Y'all seen it, it's one of the greatest movies ever in the sense, but not biblically, but I, you, God could use anything. So here we go. This movie Troy, there's this big old giant and he's like, oh, I can beat anybody. I can destroy anyone. And long story short, here comes this little scrawny man and he just takes him out with one hit. 
people, he, the giant laughs, right, as he sees him, and then this little dude just comes in, just goes, whoop, and just takes him down, this giant falls. That came from the Bible, long story short. David and Goliath. And people of this day and age, the Bible says multiple times, God always chooses the things that are weak in this world, the things that no one considers, the things that no one thinks about, the things that everyone looks down or despises. Those are the people God chooses. And he still never changes. And he does that today. And he chooses prophets, prophetesses. He chooses pastors and preachers and all these people who are weak in the world to do his work. And he chooses you. And he chooses me. And he chooses all kinds of weird people. (laughs) So with that being said, we should be encouraged by this. We should be. A lot of us think that we got to get master's degree in biblical studies and theologians and go to seminary and all this stuff. And I think those things are great. But those things don't define you. What if, what if you can't do those things or don't have the finances or whatever, or time? And you just read your Bible. You just go to church. You think to yourself, I'm nobody. Moses thought the same thing. David thought the same thing about himself. We read the Psalms, but he didn't think that about God. That was the difference. The difference between me, you're probably wondering, is like, what about you, Jeremy? You're so bold. You're just going out there saying it, the truth, but that my power and myself, I can't do this alone. I pray every day. I need your strength as David prayed. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. Or I need everything that you provide. I can't do this. Today, I posted a sermon that is a very hard sermon to post. And I, it was one of the sermons I was like, I don't want to post it. It's so embarrassing because I'm going out. I'm ripping it. And I just pray. I said, God, give me courage. Give me courage. Every day I come up here to preach a message, I need courage. I can't do it by myself. God, I need your help because I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. Nobody wants to be scrutinized, judged. You know, pick apart my sermon, pick apart everything. Oh, it's not Bible, this and that, you know. Or what is he talking about? It's crazy. I feel like a crazy person in my town, long story short. I feel like a crazy person in my family and and everyone thinks I'm crazy. It's not fun being the black sheep of the world, your family, your friends of everyone. It's not fun. But there's something unique to it. Not of like, I'm like, oh, I'm unique and I'm amazing. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's something when you find out who you are in Christ, there's something amazing about it that is unparalleled to anything else. There's only one me. There's only one you. There's only one spouse or one of your children. There's only one of them. There's never going to be another one like them, like Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham was called by God to offer his son up, Isaac, he said, I'll give you the stars. You sacrifice your only son. But there's only one Isaac. There'll never be another Isaac. There will never be another you. There will never be another Jesus. That's how amazing our God is. We're all unique in all of his creation. There's only one of those kinds of trees in my yard. There's only one of those. We may all kind of look the same and kind of act the same, kind of believe the same things, but we're all unique and different. So with that being said, I want to finish on David. David... In the world's eyes, David was a nobody. They were looking at all his brothers. They were renowned. They, were, they stood upright. They, <laughs> and they, um, they had the right smile. They had the right look and posture, the right muscles, probably the right education. They went to school. And I forget the prophet at the time, but God speaks to him. He's like, where's the other boy? I think there was like four brothers and David was the fifth or something like that. I may be wrong. So they finally, they're like, oh, he's in the, being a shepherd. Oh, you don't want him. And maybe you're feeling like that. You're feeling like that the God doesn't want you because you're not a big preacher. You're not a big 
renowned person or you don't have the talents or gifts or you don't maybe you're and that's exactly who God uses with that being said they've got him they got him okay get him bring him over here but none of those guys were willing to fight Goliath none of his brothers the renowned looking strong they, none of them wanted to fight Goliath they're like oh no I ain't fighting Goliath here comes this scrawny little boy and he's just like hey what's going on here oh, I'm just walking by taking out the trash he's like the dumpster guy in like a restaurant you know <laughs> he's small dude and and God's like he's going to be the next king and he's like should I finish taking out the trash? Like, <laughs> and, and the world is looking at this little boy and they're thinking, yeah, right. They did the same thing with Moses. They did the same thing with all the prophets. They did the same thing with all the apostles. They did the same thing to Jesus. They questioned him. His own family questioned him. How is he great? He, isn't his father Joseph and his mother Mary? Doesn't he have these brothers and sisters? He's doing all these mighty works. Where did he learn this stuff? We watched him the whole time. Out of nowhere, he just, he just changed. We've, we've seen him grow up the whole time. He, just, he was just an average person. He was a nobody, actually. He didn't stand out. There's a part of the Bible that's completely left out about Jesus from he, he, the age of 12 to the age of when he showed up for his ministry work. What happened at that time? No one knows. Or maybe you're feeling like that. Maybe you're feeling like no one knows who you are. God says, I see you. I've always seen you. And I see the David in you. I see the Moses in you. Now I want to go into New Testament times where Jesus says to the stubborn of heart, the people of this world, the, even some some." Bible believing people, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, right? They supposed to know God. They're supposed to know him. Right? We know God. This is his word, it's basically his diary, and I know everything about him. He stood right in front of their face and they didn't even recognize him. They try to teach him his word. He's like, I am the word. It's me in the flesh. And they're like, no, it's not. I'll tell you who you are. I'll tell you about God. And he's like, I am he. That's Jesus, right? So with that being said, it's very interesting because Jesus says something amazing. He says, if you would have believed Moses, if you believe Moses, you will believe me. So I'm saying the same thing that Moses is saying back in the Old Testament times. Moses was having a hard time in the wilderness. A lot of people had to die. A whole generation had to die in the wilderness because they wouldn't listen. They were so stubborn. They were so knuckleheaded. And he's saying, Moses is speaking against you. You're defend you think that Moses is defending you? He's, he's speaking against you and what you're doing. Because you won't believe that I am he, Jesus is saying. And, and Moses had a tough time convincing the people. They almost wanted to kill him. They, they tried to. They didn't believe in what he said at that time. But here in the New Testament, they're like, we worship, we know Moses talks to God. And Jesus is saying, I am God. And I talked to Moses. And if you believed him, you would believe me. So let me contemporize that. How does that affect you? Maybe you're feeling like a nobody like Moses or David or the prophets or apostles. They won't believe me. And that's what God is saying. They never do. I never change how I do things. I still call the weak in the world as I did then. And I still call them today to do amazing, glorious things for my kingdom. And the world will look at them. They ain't got the right face. They ain't got the right clothes on. They ain't got the right degrees, you know, education or whatever. Where did this man learn from? They asked, 
about Jesus? Where did he learn from? He, we didn't see him go to school. We, we were in the top of the classes. We know everyone in the school. Even the t- they were the teachers of the law. They were the teachers, the scribes. They were the, We didn't even see him. Where did he go to school? Where did he get all his learning from? I'm not saying anything is wrong with school and learning more about God. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is God doesn't need it. All he needs is obedient people. He can speak through a donkey. He can speak through you. He can speak through me. But the world is always looking for signs. The Jews are looking for signs. The Greeks are looking for wisdom. And God's looking for you who has faith. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for those who simply have faith like a child. He's not looking for those who are... uh, who have all the knowledge and wisdom in the world. He's not looking for those with amazing gifts and talents and whatnot. He's looking for simply people to have a faith as small as a mustard seed, like a child that just believes. I will go where you go. I will do what you do. Where you stay, I will stay. God, I don't care if it makes sense or doesn't make sense. I'm going to do it. That's what God is looking for. Faithful people even if they can't see, even if they don't understand or know what they're doing or will know what's happening. We're all sheep in this and God is the shepherd. I'm not a shepherd, I'm a sheep. I'm I'm a sheep that follows very closely to the shepherd. So everything I hear, I'm like just passing it down the line. Stay close, stay close, stay close to Jesus. Stay close into the word. Because the enemy's always trying to get you distracted. He's always trying to distract the sheep. So, in all being said, there's a Goliath, there's a David in you. There's a Moses in you. There's a Paul in you. There's a Daniel in you. There's a Joshua in you. But you can't do anything about it within yourself. You have to let God draw it out of you. I tried to use this analogy multiple times, but I'm going to try again. There's a seed. And in this little seed is going to be a huge tree. It's going to go up to the heavens. But it's just this little seed. Right? No one thinks anything of it. Oh, it's small. I can't do anything today. It's like David's slingshot. That can't hurt me. You're going to throw a rock at my face? But he hit him right in the spot. I think he hit him in the temple, but he hit him right in the right spot and killed him. God is showing it that he can use the smallest thing to make the biggest impact. And he wants to use you. He wants to use your weaknesses. The things that the world shames, he wants to use that. He's like, that gives me glory. I, 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 can, I can take the things that are weak. I could take your, your mistakes and I can make them prolific. I can make them am- amazingly huge. But if you trust me with it, use your personal testimony like a seed planted and I will grow it into this amazing huge tree. The world is always telling us to pretend Like, we have nothing wrong. Pretend that you're perfect. Pretend that you have no issues in your life. And God is saying, the church is filled with people who have issues. And when you're open about your issues, when you're open about things that are happening in your life, that glorifies me because that shows shows your faith that you trust. The world isn't that way. The world covers up their sin. They hide. They ignore their sin. I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. If they don't say it, they definitely act like it. So I'm going to try to end and basically say that God is calling his church to be faithful. And the things that they don't understand and place, go places they've never been before, do things they've never done before, stretch out and walk into the unknown. Moses was willing to do that. Jesus was willing to do that. 
even when he was getting nailed to a cross. I trust you, Lord. And maybe it just starts start small with you. Maybe, you know, those who are trusted with little will be trusted with much. And God is simply saying, do the small things that you know you can do. Master them. Get good at that. And when you're ready, I will guide you into something greater. But you have to understand the key principles of each stage of learning that I'm bringing you through. You may think it's a storm. You may think it's a trial. You may think I'm not with you. But I want you to learn something from this first before I take you into the next um, room or adventure or valley. So don't be discouraged. People this day, they never remember these amazing prophets, these amazing leaders until the end of their ministry, until the end of their life. Jesus they didn't believe him the whole way through. They didn't even believe after they buried him. And, and they finally believed when he resurrected. Moses, the whole time, his whole life, it was just, they wanted to kill him. They hated him. They didn't want to listen, so on and so forth. Every single prophet, every single leader, every single person in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Paul, Paul is going out preaching to everybody. Nobody wanted to listen. Nobody wanted to care. And that's the way it's going to be, unfortunately. People are not going to care. People are not going to see you. They're not going to understand you. They're going to think you're crazy. And at the end of Moses' life, they, they practically worshipped him as, as, as a god or a, as God. The Pharisees, they were like, we believe in Moses. We believe in him. <laughs> After, you know, King David didn't become king until after all the trials that he had to go through. We read the Psalms. Most of it is his youth. He didn't even become king. He was anointed king when he was like a 13, 14 years old, probably 15, somewhere around there. He didn't become a king until he was 40 years old. He had to go through all that. And maybe that's what you're going through. You're going through a lot and you're wondering, why, why, why? Trust me, David was going through the same thing. He was wondering, why, why? Surely not me. Look at my mistakes. Surely not me. And God's like, you watch and wait. We need like another Billy Graham. We need like another anointed person from the Lord that just does these amazing things. And I know they're out there. Maybe I just need to open my ears, open my eyes or find them. YouTube and all that stuff, but that's who they were. People didn't never believe until after the fact. They're just going to doubt the whole time. Yeah. So don't get discouraged. You just keep the faith. And unfortunately, people won't recognize what you did until later in your life or after you die. I feel like Paul was so... I mean, Jesus' teachings are so revolutionary. It's so sad that we still have all the problems that we have in the world. And, it's st and what he taught still matters. Well, because he's God. We know that. But they don't know that. We know that. He already is addressing race. He's already addressing these political issues. He's already addressing the family issues, the husband and the wife, the children. He's addressing those issues and already 2,000 years ago. The world wasn't ready for that. Maybe the, that's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, today, even probably to the day that you die, the world won't be ready for you. But you need to lay the seeds while you're here. Because the generation after you, or maybe the one after, or maybe a few more after, will finally be ready to hear you way after you're already gone. So what are we here to do? We're here to sow God's word. Let, God, let people think you're crazy today because tomorrow you'll be the greatest woman who've ever, who's ever lived. John Calvin, John Wesley, a lot of these guys, they, they, they were, I read their stuff and I go, oh my gosh. You know, but at their time when they were here on earth, they were just insane. And that's just the way it's going to be. When Moses was here, he was insane. When David was here, they were like, they're crazy. 
And now we look at the Bible, we read it, and it's like God's word was preached through David. David probably couldn't have imagined that. His words were going to become part of God. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. Right? Rahab, she was a prostitute crying out loud. And she's a great, great or some grandmother of Jesus. Oh, man. And it doesn't end there. The Bible is everything that we need here. But the real one, I believe, it's still tying in in heaven. God's word is the book. We're all tied into that. And God is like, I want to see my church move. I believe that God doesn't intervene on everything for reasons because he wants to see his children do his work. To have the faith today, I realized I woke up and I said, I don't want to post that sermon. It was a really harsh sermon. You might have saw it. Maybe you didn't. It's called Love God, Love People. It was hard. And I said, God, I don't know if I want to do this. This is scary. scary. I'm going to be judged by all these people. And he said this to me. He says, do you remember this? There's this part in the Bible where things, history changed based off of what human beings did in the Bible. Long story short whether they did it or didn't do it. And he says, if you do it, it's going to be beneficial for the future generation, for your children, for your children's children, children's children. But if you don't do it, it's like going to be, they're going to be held back in time. It's like all this much more suffering will happen. I was like, it was a sacrifice. It's just like, okay. I just put the video out there and I shared it to every page I had that I liked or joined on Facebook. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna look like an idiot today. And it just encouraged me. And God said, look at my Bible. Moses, in the eyes of his own people, was an idiot, was a foolish man, was crazy. Paul was crazy. They weren't literally crazy. They were literally sane. They were literally doing what was true. But that's how the world looked at them. And that's how the world looks at us as Christians. We have to die from this mentality to think that we need to fit in the world. God is not calling us to fit in. He's calling us to leave the world and step into our real identity, to step into who we really are, regardless of what people judge us for. And that's the hardest thing. I think the greatest fear in this world is what people think about you. What people think about me. It hurts. No one wants to be alone. No one wants to be an outcast. Everyone wants to be accepted. But I promise you, the world will never accept you completely for who you are. Ever. They always change their standards. God says, step into something that never changes. I never change. My word never changes. My love for you never changes. And believe that. And he who acknowledges me above men, I will acknowledge him to my father who is in heaven. Sometimes it just takes losing relationships to gain the most important one. The love of God. Can you imagine being crucified? Your own family members your own friends and the community members who saw you grow up, they saw you do amazing miracles, you love them, and all of them, none of them are defending you. All of them are doubting you, probably even hating you. And you're up there, and the only person up there with you is God. (laughs) If you want to be a leader, man, that's what the Lord's going to bring you through. And if you can't do that, to stay in the flock and follow the ones God's appointed, the Moseses and the Davids and the apostles, because it's hurtful when the one who's right next to you in the physical body, your spouse or whoever, the ones you think that love you the most, and they love you, but you're, God's going to call you to do things that it's they're not going to completely agree with what you're doing. Moses' own wife turned him away. Circumcise your son, God says. And he did it, and his wife 
spit in Moses' face practically. Curse you. Job. <laughs> but these men shaped the biblical world. They shaped eternity. Their names are written in, not only written in heaven, they're, they're, they're ever, ever lasting and permanent. I want my name right there. Do you want your name up there? It's going to cost you. No great name has ever been something great if there wasn't a price to pay, if there wasn't sacrifice that had to be made, whether it was their reputation, whether it was their relationships, or whatever, whatever it was. So I just hope that God can use me in amazing ways to be remembered forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. God bless you.